and I'm just ferocious. I want your heart. I want to eat your children. Praise be to Allah. I took up the world. I took up the world. Oh, uh, I took up the world. Mike, were you really sick this week? What was the problem? I broke my back. Back, back, back. Back, back, back. Try and stop it. Back, back. Here I come. Back. Do you want to throw sometime? Back. Bang. 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 And when Pat want to throw back? Bang. Keep coming. Taylor in trouble. Front. Punch it. He puts it. And it is over. I'm going back to England, Mom. And I'm keeping my title. I just motherfucker. Fight him. Always get him. Go on, fight this fucking guy! Yeah, he ends up in the referee sucks! All you work for! The ref sucks! Fight him! Fuck the referee! Come on, Get out there! Fight him! Hey, boxing fans, and welcome to a Thursday edition of what I think we'll be calling the hey, Midweek Madness from welcome. Boxing Asylum Nuthouse. I'm your old host, uh, Matty D. With your new host, Andy Patterson and Alex Morris. And uh, we're just here to talk about a few things uh, going on in boxing this week. It's not a big week in boxing. Uh, Crazy Jurgen is fighting against Krasnicki. Uh, there's a really fun fight that could be on tomorrow night between Alfonso Gomez and our favorite superhero, Kama Guy. Uh, but this week, what really has me interested, Andy, and uh, just makes perfect sense finally they're doing it is on the canelo kirkland undercard on hbo we are finally going to have roman gonzalez fighting and he'll be against edgar sosa uh what do you think about this development in uh you know our favorite division 112 pounds yeah uh, very great decision my in all honesty um roman gonzalez very, very underrated fighter. I think, well, he's obviously he's not underrated to the hardcore fans, obviously, but he just needs to get that more exposure, especially on HBO. First time on HBO, um, good to see him on it. Um, it bodes well for the future, especially if he's very, very successful against Souza. Um, obviously, HBO got the budget. I mean, they were talking about a rematch with Strada a couple of months back, uh, something like, I think it was a million dollars to try and get the fight together. Um, that, m- m- that money is to be shared amongst the Gonzalez and Estrada. HBO, hopefully they can make that fight happen. Estrada's obviously got to look good as well in his next fight. But Gonzalez, Souza as well. Souza is definitely his last chance to win here. Um, definitely. Gonzalez, he's 30, 35 now, Souza. I think Gonzalez is going to probably blast him out within seven eight rounds. But really, really good move from HBO, actually. It's about time these flyweights uh, were showing more on the mainstream channels. I mean, obviously we've been used to we're watching Zhao Jiming. Uh, or show shipming as uh, as Kurt would say, uh, but it's good to see the top guys now getting, well, especially the lineal flyweight jumping out a shot on HBO. It's a good move, great move, and I hope we see more of it in the future. Yeah, and it it seems like with more uh, exposure for Gonzalez, we're looking at some cool potential fights. Um, the uh, the guy that just beat uh, Butler there in the UK, um, can't remember his name right off the top of my head. Tete, I think. And then, um, Alex, the fight that really I'm thinking of, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, end of this year, early next year, if they could find a way to put it together, would be a 115-pound fight between Gonzalez and Inui. What do you think about that one? Yeah, I mean, it's a fight I think all of us are looking forward to, especially if you're, uh, you know, into your lower weights. I think even the people that don't normally take notice of the lower weights have started to realize that this is a pretty big fight. Um... I don't think it will happen this year, unfortunately. What with uh, Inoue's uh, hand injury, I think it's hand injury, and he, you know he's out for about nine months, isn't he? Out to August, I think, at the bare minimum. So I don't think that we'll get the sufficient uh, build up to that fight uh, between Gonzalez and Inoue. Uh, hopefully, we can still see um, uh, bigger, bigger fights for Gonzalez in that meantime. I mean, there's still the Estrada rematch. That's still. You know, a relative super fight at that weight. Um, Estrada's been, you know, really come on leaps and bounds since uh, the first loss to Gonzalez, which is, you know, it was, it was a very good fight. I think people, if they're looking for fights of Gonzalez's to watch, to get into him and uh, really see what he's all about, then you, you should go watch that first Estrada fight. You should watch the 
uh, your Gashi fight. Um, there's a few others as well that you know I've been trying to post them up on Twitter this week. Uh, you know I've seen a lot of interest from people in. You know they're saying, oh, finally we're going to see Gonzalez. He's on the mainstream. You know there's no sort of excuses for not watching him now because you know I, I understand that you know that some people say they don't want to watch him because. You know, it, the shows are usually, you know, Japanese or, uh, you know, Spanish or something and just people don't really understand what's going on and it can be a bit confusing and the lower weights, people just don't have a clue what's really, you know, what the landscape of it is. Gonzalez could be fighting anyone and, you know, that guy could be a bum or he could be, you know, literally the lineal champion and they couldn't know the difference so they don't really understand what they're seeing but when they see him on uh, HBO, on that undercard, they you know, Sosa is a is a very capable veteran. You know, you you'd expect, I think, a tougher opponent for someone's HBO debut. But no, they've stuck him right in there with a very capable opponent. Um, but ultimately, I think he's going to get just utterly beat down purely from the standpoint that Gonzalez is a beast. And yeah, I think that unfortunately we won't get the Inoue fight this year, but. Is something to look forward to next year, perhaps. You know, New Year's Eve seems to be the big thing in Japan where they have their super fights, you know, much like the Cinco de Mayo and uh, Mexican Independence weekends for the, uh, big in the US. You know, for them it's New Year's Eve. Yeah, those, those cards are always worth um, getting up for. And uh, it's before for us on New Year's Eve, so, you know, there's not to deal with the hangover the next day and stuff like that. So, not too bad, but. Uh, I just watched that Estrada uh, Gonzalez fight the other day. Even fight through six, four two the last six for Gonzalez. Real, real, real close fight. I think I scored it the same first time. But um, I, going back to Noy, just to kind of spread things around a little bit here, since we got some time to fill. Andy, do you think that the boxing world has kind of overlooked what a big deal it is to demolish Omar Narvaez like that? Yeah, it's a statement, definitely. Um, people look at, going into that fight, I would probably say, would probably maybe look at Inoue, maybe winning that, definitely winning the fight, probably, because Narvaez passed his prime at that point. He hadn't looked good in some of his previous fights as well. I think he had a, his rematch with his prime at that point. He hadn't looked good. I'm going to a hand just now. But just talking about Inoue, I mean, this, this kid is a fantastic talent. I mean, when I first came on to him, I think it was just not long after his second fight, my to uh, obtain some of his amateur career as well. Great fighter. He actually, his style in amateurs actually was actually how he fights just now. Just you know, the attack to the body is absolutely ferocious. The left hook that he throws is unbelievable. Um, Narvaez, as I was talking about there, I think he had a rematch with Carter. I think it was. This is two very close fights. It hadn't really looked good. He didn't even come to win against Dunair, in all honesty. Pure survival job. Um, but. Dealing with them like that in two rounds was, was absolutely incredible, in my personal opinion. Uh, the Gonzalez fight, obviously, it's one for the future, as, as Alex says. You know, August is the bare minimum, as, as he says as well. Um, could be next year before we even see Inui back in the ring. Um, this is a shame, but uh, Gonzalez, well, I'm really glad to see him actually cementing his place in the top 10. Seen him, uh, sorry, top 10 pound for pound. We've seen him ranked as high as fourth. Um, I think it was just last week, actually. I mean, it, it, it's it's certainly not overhyped. It's on merit because if you look at his career, going, especially going back to 2009, he's got a 12-round decision against Kantasura Takayama, who's twice went on now since then to become uh, a double unified world champion at minimum weight. He's got really good wins against Omar Saldo, Soto, Jimenez, uh, Ramon Harales. I think he's still campaigning as well at light flyweight. Uh, obviously, the Strada fight, Rodriguez Jr., um, that was a really good fight. He's since went on to have a good fight with Takayama. Oscar Blanket, um, I think he's challenged for the world title as well. And of course, Yagasi Fuentes uh, in his 2014. Um, and he's obviously had that, um, that three round knockout against Valentino Leon. Uh, and he's back in the ring again. That was only uh, last month, so he's back in the ring in May. You can see Gonzalez active and uh, very, very justly merited. Yeah, the top 10 pound for pound ranking. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, you, you can tell a lot about where a lot of boxing writers don't pay attention to by the lack of the smaller guys in their list. Um, it's funny that, you know, you mentioned the four spot. That, you know, that's where I have Gonzalez. And that's, I think it's totally reasonable. I think uh, 
considering his recent run. Um, the way he's uh, three weight classes, I mean, just demolishing him and holding his and still being a puncher at those lower weights is something else. Um, do you think the Sosa actually poses any threat to him for his HBO debut, though, Andy? Uh, no, mate, no, I really don't think so. I mean, I think Alex mentioned it as well that you probably will get steamrolled. I mean, I did say, I think I said about maybe, I think it was the start of last year, 2014, I think, I think it was, um, going into the Yagashi fight, um, he was pretty well handily beaten, and Yagashi has probably not been the strongest flyweight title holder in history, but you know, it was very, very good fundamentals about him. And uh, Yagashi just basically, I think he beat him 116-112 and 117-111 or something like that. Um, at that time, it was last chance alone. Now, that's what, 2013, December 2013, that's what, two, well, a year passed. I really don't think so, mate. I mean, his last fight there was in November, 10-round decision. Won it pretty easily, but nah, against Gonzalez, he's in his prime, mate. Uh, it's, just, it's just not going to happen, unfortunately. You know, but it's it's a good show because a lot of the time the issue that people have, and it, it's funny because going back when I was watching the uh, uh, Estrada Gonzalez fight, uh, Larry Holmes was on the announce team, and he kept commenting how you know it's cool and everything, but they really can't hurt each other. And I think that thought process goes through with a lot of people because um, if you look, I mean, the only time that boxing is really really popular in the U.S. is you know when there's a a black heavyweight champion from our country. It's just, that's, you know, for some reason it's what we're into. So people are so dismissive of it, you know, going up to Larry Holmes, but with, uh, Roman Gonzalez on there going against, you know, faded Edgar Sosa, you know, he's probably going to make a name for himself. So it's probably the right opponent thinking about that. Um, Alex, what, what are your thoughts of, before we get into our pound for pound list, uh, when it comes to the neglect that some boxing scribes have when in, including these smaller guys, um, among the ranks of the best fighters currently active in the sport. Yeah, I mean, obviously it depends what which you know journalists you're talking to and which uh, writers are really giving their opinions. There's a lot who are um, you know are very guilty of not including the lower weights purely, you know, just from an ignorant standpoint. They they're, they're not really aware of the situation at, at the lower weights. They're not really sure how you know a win really how significant it is at the lower weights or sometimes they you know that their criteria includes things like you know fame and uh not- you know, notability as well and things like that and i think that you know you can understand why some of those things happen but ultimately a pound for pound list is about who's the best fighter you know who's the best you know who's the best in the world regardless of uh you know these extraneous things like money, these extraneous things like weight, who's the best guy in the world at beating up another guy and quite simply you can't ignore someone because he's from a you know a different country or speaks a different language it's you know completely outrageous you can understand fans doing it some fans as I said before just can't really get into the lower weights and they might exclude it but ultimately I think it's if if it's your profession to write about this sport and it's your profession to talk about this sport and you earn money from discussing this sport then you you've got no right to ignore the lower weights i mean it, it, it's completely outrageous for people to do that and you know one of my criteria when i you know start rating fighters once you know you kind of figure a body of work that you know would make them eligible at least i mean we can all rate on on potential i mean if you want to talk potential i'd say terence crawford you know is potentially one of the top five fighters in the sport that's just a personal belief of mine but you know you take all things being equal and put him in to a category with someone else. So let's say that Roman Gonzalez was actually about Pacquiao size, you know, a squat welterweight. But with his style, you know what? I'd give him one hell of a chance against a guy like Floyd Mayweather Jr. Just uh, based on his styles, you know, his ability to take it, dish it out, keep moving forward the way he moves inside. Um, you know, so, you know, all things being equal, let's do a little side the side uh, size change, Andy. I mean, what do you think about stuff like that in a way to um, look at pound for pound ratings, taking taking styles and how they would do against fighters in other class, all things else being equal? Well, you could actually flip that around a bit, mate, and actually say, you know, <laughs> you know, Vladimir Klitschko Klitschko's sitting number two with the Ring magazine. Do you, do you agree that maybe Klitschko should be number two? I mean, I noticed they've got Pacquiao doing it at three. Uh, you know what? Give Klitschko Tommy Hearn size, basically, and think of him fighting at you know 147 and 154. 
and tell me what you think he'd do with guys there. If you think that, you know, he'd beat Mayweather, given him, you know, a Tommy Hearn size and his skill set against Floyd, you know, I think that could be a reasonable ranking. All right. You want to go to the top 10, you can maybe have a look at all things being equal then. Carl Froch and Roman Gonzalez. Froch is ranked number eight. Alex, you like that one, mate. What, Froch being ranked? Froch and Gonzalez. Yeah, I mean, what, is he? Hot? Is Froch higher than Gonzalez on the Ring magazine? No, he's number eight. Give him the stature of Curtis Stevens. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a tough thing, really, to rate that and, you know, it, how they would fight each other, I suppose. if That's that's ultimately what a pound-for-pound pound list is, really, isn't it? I mean, you're comparing... Well, it's, it's difficult because you're trying to rate who's the best fighter and who would arguably beat the other guy, but, you know, you've got to include these things like resume as well and things like that, and obviously Froch has got an excellent resume, but so does Gonzalez as well in, in a pure fight. Um, obviously, I would probably prefer Gonzalez, but you can understand why a lot of people would pick Froch as well for his chin and his ability to take a lot of punishment and sort of whether the um, uh, punishment that he's getting. So it's difficult. And obviously, Froch has been in these uh, bigger fights and uh, bigger events as well. Like I was saying before, do you count that in your criteria? Do you think that this guy was in a huge event? This guy was you know, in one of the most important fights in the, you know, in the last year or the last couple of years, and obviously we're, we're going to be seeing that with Fighter A, Fighter B, uh, they're a huge event, and how that will affect them, obviously that's a legacy defining fight, uh, it might not be uh, as important as it once was in terms of their ability and their primes, but it's still a legacy defining fight, and legacy is often uh, very important in this, in assessing these sorts of things, especially like as an all-time great status and pound for pound throughout history. Absolutely, um, yeah, and uh, it's good to see that people are you know even towards the end are trying to build legacies, hint around without mentioning the rule still applies, eh, Andy? Uh, but I figured I'd jump in here and give you my list here first, and I'll hop over to you, Andy, then you, Alex. But uh, right now, I yeah. have. I have Floyd at number one, Pack at number two. I think you know he's had a couple of good wins to move him up. Three Vlad, four Gon- or uh, three uh, three Gonzalez, four Vlad, five Bradley, six Marquez, eight Froch, nine Rigo, ten Kovalev. Or I think I missed one. I think GGG's in there at the end too, but I think I missed a spot on the list. Bleh. But uh, I think there's I think there's some defense in there. I think Bradley got hosed against Chavez, and there's going to be a lot of argument about where he's at. Andy, where are you got? I really don't know about Marquez. Um, well, by what uh, almost a year in May, I think it is since he last fought. He's certainly kind of slipping down there actually, but um, definitely Floyd number one, Pacquiao two. Um, obviously, the the big thing is with, with Ward now getting removed. I would probably go with Gonzalez. At three, Klitschko at four, Rigondo at five, Bradley six, Froch seven, uh, eight, probably Marquez, um, try to think now, ten, definitely would need to be Kovalev, we're about <coughs> ten or nine for, for that one. Uh, if I put Kovalev nine and come back to me in the tenth. What do you got, Alex? Yeah, obviously I've got Floyd at number one. I think that unless you're a sort of really bad hater or you you, you are a massive fan of another fighter, then you can't really argue Floyd at number one. Uh, number two is again debatable, uh, but I've chosen Pacquiao for number two because just because of his body of work. Uh, the Tim Bradley win is excellent. Uh, you know, he's not looked as good as he once was, but name another fighter who's achieved as much as he has in the past few years. Uh, number three, I've got Rigondo. Number four, Gonzalez. Number five, Vlad. Uh, number six, Bradley. Number seven, Golovkin. It took me a while to add Golovkin to my list. Uh, that's more of a potential thing. I still am not really, you know, overwhelmingly impressed with his resume, but I do think Gonz- uh, Golovkin has got a really big potential for the future. Uh, number eight, I've got Estrada. Number nine, Kovalev, and uh, number ten, uh, Karl Froch. 
I like that Carl Frost is on all these lists now. I think he's definitely earned his way, if anybody has. Matty, mm. Matty would you, what about Crawford? Would you see any way that Crawford could maybe reach the top ten? You know, if he was to beat uh, Delorme and then a good name at 140, I think he could be creeping, but... You know, um, and Frotch is definitely on his way out. You know, we don't even know if he's going to retire yet. So there's going to be some openings, but he just... Um, what about Estrada? Is all... Estrada? God, that's a tough one. I guess that kind of depends on how you rate, rate Melindo, huh? That's true. That's true. That's true. Because, I mean, I mean if that, that'd be kind of... I guess that's his signature win to this point. I'm trying to think of another one that... Nothing's coming up. I mean, I guess the signature fight is Gonzalez in the loss, but, you know, I mean, no shame, obviously. Um, I'm trying to think of other guys that could be knocking on the door here. Thurman's knocking on the door here um, if he could get a couple of more good fights. Um, you know, I mean, because he could build a resume very fast in a stack division. The Canelo as well. So. Probably, if he does keep his, his reign of terror going, actually, at featherweight, possibly. Nicholas Walters, maybe within yeah. the next 12 months, 12 to 18 months, you could probably see Walters knocking on that door. Um, Speaking of featherweights, what about um, Lomachenko and obviously uh, another sort of monster in a way? I think they're yeah. knocking on the door. I mean, Lomachenko's resume ain't great considering he has that loss to uh, Salido, but for pure potential, he's got to be close. Yeah, I, I really does. I would really like to see. Lomachenko try and grab all the belts. I know it's people like, well, well what's all the belts? You got the PBC and all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, as well, is you want one person universally recognised. And if the only way you got to do that to grab all the belts, uh, then you've got to make it happen. Lomachenko, if he can do that, I mean, it's like going, he also has to fight Walters in order to do it as well. So um, make the fight. Yeah, I mean, potentially. I mean, that, that's a kind of fight, actually. You know, if these guys somehow grab uh, the other belts, maybe for. To fight for the main title, um, you know, I think the winner of that could be, to be definitely be knocking on the door, especially at number ten. But Garcia, Danny Garcia, by we can forget about him. I mean, what the, when was he? When did he last defend his light welterweight titles? It's over a year ago now, right. isn't it? I mean, th- that guy was really was really uh, knocking on the door. I mean, he just he's lost all momentum from the Matisse uh, win as well. The weight of the sunglasses is probably holding him back. <laughs> I don't know. This guy's t- turned into a total tool. I, you know, I definitely rate him in my top ten tools in the sport right now. I don't know if you guys would agree or disagree with that. Oh, he, he was always a bit of a knob, but um, you know, when when he beat uh, Matisse and sort of shut most of us up, we had to say we had to sit down and say, yeah, this guy's you know legit. He actually beat. The guy, you know, this absolute, you know, the machine, basically. And he shut a lot of us up. Where a lot of us picked uh, Matisse to just completely waste him. But as Andy said, he's not really built on that. He's not really taking any momentum from that win. He looked, you know, um, God, what's his name? Who did he look awful against? Herrera. He looked yeah, Herrera. Yeah, yeah. He lost that fight, in my personal yeah, yeah, he lost that. 115, 113, I think. I've watched it three, twice or three times now. I just kind of see him shading it to... To Garcia. That's it, and the fact that he's looked poor in that fight, and then he's gone on to have the the awful Rod Salka fight, and the Peterson fight. To be honest, is a bit of a mismatch. But then you don't know what Garcia is going to turn up. You know, sometimes he doesn't bother turning up, and he looks awful. And uh, you know, obviously the Khan win is quite big for him as well. Uh, I'd quite like to see the Matisse rematch if Matisse manages to get through uh, Provodnikov. That will not happen though, because you sign up with GA, they call it Golden Boy. Yeah, I know, but, you know, excluding politics and that, it would still be an interesting fight. I mean, who who else has he really got at uh, those weights that are with Heyman unless he moves up? Which is, you know, quite a distinct possibility now, isn't it? Well, this is the thing, I, I really don't know why Garcia Matty hasn't even moved up in weight, but now. I mean, obviously, he's, he's been struggling to make weight, I think, for about, what now, 18 months? I'm really surprised that they like, for instance, I mean, obviously the Salka fight got made at 142, and this one obviously is a 143. Just be done with it and get right up to the weight at 147. Well, name three top fighters that he can beat at 147 pounds. I, I dare you to find three. Guerrero is the one that comes to mind. I think he could beat, but 
the Guerrero fights the last three rounds, or fights the way he did the last three rounds against Thurman, against Garcia, I think that nullifies him. I mean, because Garcia needs needs distance to do his business. Right. About, See, um, Kelowna. I was uh, exactly. I was uh, my next question was going to be that one, Alex. I mean, obviously, if Garcia can still make one forty comfortably enough, if it's possible, you know, if Heyman's true to his word, he's getting all these fighters across the PBC and all this sort of stuff. And his intention is to either make a title or whatever it is. He needs to make these fights in house. Obviously, he needs to make these fights harm. I mean, Garcia Cloner is a fight that's going to harm. I think. Can the ring handle that much dickhead at once, though? <laughs> well, I've heard that um, Broner, well, it, they've been having a bit of a beef on Twitter, haven't they, and uh, social media. Broner and uh, Khan, um, obviously that would require Broner to go up to 147. I don't think Khan would be interested in going back down to 140 after uh, a lot of his bluster about, oh, this is my weight now, this is a better weight. And to be fair to him, I do think 147 does suit Khan a lot better. We've seen him look a lot sharper since he's moved there, but, you know, we saw how awful Broner looks at uh, welterweight. You know, the Paulie fight he didn't look particularly good in, and obviously got his ass absolutely destroyed by Maidana. I think Khan would yeah. uh, probably do the same and just school him. I think so as well, actually. Sorry, mate, I was just going to say, I mean, I, uh, Aisha will probably like this, who's in, the, who's in the mix of chat, and Donnie, who's maybe will be listening back, I think, I think potentially... Can would just absolutely take him apart, but I don't think he'd stop him. Bruno's got a really good chin, but uh, I think about wide, wide points win for Khan. Like, I, I really think the Khan, Khan smokes and wide points, or I mean, maybe a late stoppage because you, you got to throw with Khan to really get him. And you know, Broner, I mean, he's either on offense or he's on defense, and his offense is certainly more uh, dangerous than his defense. I mean, there's nothing. Really, I think Khan can't crack. I mean, you just keep a bunch of straight punches in and be active. It's just, I think it's a stylistic nightmare for Broner personally. As you say, he's got anyone who's who's fighting Khan. I think they've got to throw with him. I mean, he still does. Although he's more straighter in his shots, he can still be prone to throw wide shots and still be left open to, to counter hooks <laughs> and stuff. Um, I just don't see Broner maybe being quick enough to deal with him. I think Khan would just shut him down once he's, if he feels he's maybe overreached, he'd be just falling into a clinch. I think. Uh, I think Khan obviously's got the size and the reach on him as well. Yeah, I mean, the, we the thing is about Khan is that you know his level is is the uh, the thing, and you know the styles and the people that will give him problems. Uh, some fights are easier to guess than others, but you know I'm just about sure that he'd beat Broner. And I'm 99% positive that Thurman would take him out in about four round, would take uh, Khan out in about four rounds. You know, just a style thing. But I also still think that Thurman would probably smoke Broner in about four rounds too. So, but we all know how I feel about you. You're um, really, you're really on that Thurman train, man. <laughs> you know, it, it it hasn't gone off the rails yet, buddy. So I'm riding it. <laughs> what happened again? What uh, happened with Matisse again? Yeah, these things happen. What are you gonna do? Got exposed. What are you gonna do? It's still it's still good to have a guy that can that can has game changing power and is entertaining and stuff. You know, sometimes you have more hope in those guys than you should and but they're still good, you know, they're still worth their they're you know, they're waiting in gold, honestly, when it comes to entertaining fights. I mean Matisse Provodnikov is gonna be freaking ridiculous if it's anything but I'm gonna be shocked. I mean, shot. be honest, mate. I mean, obviously, you've not been on the show for a while, but be honest, right? I mean, you were big on Matisse you know, very early doors, right? We didn't hear much for you after that, that fight, especially on the on the podcast against Garcia. Going into the the Molina fight, was you still kind of saying to yourself, like, okay, he's, he's still a good fight, I'm going to back him all the way, or was you really, really kind of just right off the train by that point? Nah, man, I still I still love the guy to death. I get a kick out of him, man. He tattoos himself and uh, eats iguanas and crap. I don't know. He just I get a kick out of the bastard. So you know, he's just one of those guys that you know I find endearing for whatever reason. So I don't know. Um, hey, I do have a conspiracy theory I wanted to share with oh, you guys. Oh, here though. we go. Check this one out. This is kind of interesting. Going back to the uh, the Berto. Um, Lopez fight. So you know the way that Heyman's deals work on the uh, on those profession uh, professional boxing champions, PCB, whatever the shit he's got it called. He's, he's bought ESPN, though, is he not? 
Yeah, whatever. Yeah, but whatever series of adjectives he's using. But so he's on bot time. So I had that DVR and on DVR. You know, you got the option add thirty minutes because it's live. But I know that he bought time, so I didn't do it. the The fight ended with literally ninety seconds left to go in Heyman's purchase time. Just saying. <laughs> Anyone want to touch that? Alex, I'd like you to touch that. Anyway, I'm just reading this article. You've just uh, kindly put me on to that we won't discuss. Oh, we should discuss that. Um, what are you saying, Matty? Sorry, I, I was distracted by uh, the, the chat then. About Heyman buying ESPN. Matty, I lost them. Yeah, Heyman's, Heyman's bot time on the... Uh, for the Spike Television card with Berto Lopez, Alex, was 90 seconds away from the time that he had purchased where it would no longer be his time and go into something else when the fight was stopped. Right. Did you watch... I've never seen that fight, actually. Did you watch that one, Alex? I mean, there was something about the stoppage or something. I think the referee waved it off pretty quick or something. Is that right? I've never seen the fight. I thought, what, the Berto Lopez fight... Yeah, apparently it was 90 seconds before the, the, the broadcast time was ending. What, and uh, that's the conspiracy theory that yeah. it was... <sighs> it ended 90 seconds that's, before... That's Matty's, per- that's Matty's conspiracy up. theory. Yeah, I'm I'm one, I'm one. quite a cynic when it comes to these things, and I thought the stoppage was fairly early. I thought that uh, Lopez should have been given the chance to at least uh, stand up and sort of give an account for himself and look in the ref's eyes and say, yeah, I'm okay, or, you know, stagger about like a drunk. I thought that he was really badly hurt, and, uh, you know, I'd err on the side of saying, yeah, it should have been stopped, but give the man a chance, you know. He was winning the fight up to that point, and it was a bit premature. It really was a good fight, Andy. I mean, it's. I think it's certainly worthy of uh, throwing on your hard drive. It's. Oh, you know, it was certainly entertaining. I'll go and have a look for it just now. So, um, what before we go happening? on to this next, what's that? What else has been happening? Alex, you don't know why I talk about that, are you, mate? Do you want to? It, no. It, it's quite a big thing. I saw it on Twitter. Um, Lance Pugmire was uh, the guy doing it. So in the chat there, mate. Bye. I'll mention it. I mean, quite That's r- I, I posted it on Twitter before we went live. Uh, fighter A and Fighter B. Leave me out yet. The, 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 uh, Floyd and Pacquiao, the drug testing, obviously. That was a very serious issue for uh, making that fight initially, wasn't it? Floyd made a big deal about uh, drug testing and Manny initially set one of his cut off dates and things like that. It was, it's obviously a very big issue. A couple of weeks ago, uh, sorry, a couple of days ago, I was making a point that there's only six weeks worth of testing for this fight, and that that really annoyed me because, you know, surely they should have been testing a lot longer ago if they really cared about cleaning up this sport and really uh, cared about dealing with, um, you know, these issues and testing issues. But six weeks before a fight is absolutely nothing. Both men could have easily been uh, training before that, you know, January, February. Uh, earlier this month and they could have been juiced into the fucking gills if they wanted Manny was only tested last week I don't think Floyd's been tested yet at all Um, and then the news came out today that even if uh, I think either man possibly only Floyd if either man fails a test uh, you start a random test the fight will still go on the fight will still be happening on May 2nd even if they fail a test but obviously afterwards they will face a ban, a four-year ban or whatever, and the consequences, but the fight will still go on. So what's the fucking point? What's the point in testing? Well, who cares? Yeah, if they're allowed to fight and they're banned, I mean, at that point, the money they're making from this, I mean, you know, that's their wad. I mean, yeah. if you manage to blow that in your lifetime, you're a fucking mong. They're probably going to retire. Either one of them will probably retire after this fight anyway, so what do they care? That's exactly, I mean, obviously Floyd's association with Alex Ariza and Memo Heredia are, you know, very suspicious and uh, should, no one's bringing that up. No one's noted a damn thing about that because they're all scared of losing their press passes and scared of being, you know, ostracized for daring to question such a blatantly dodgy and corrupt partnership. 
you know, there was such a big deal about the fact that uh, Manny was working with Alex Ariza for so long and Marquez was working with Heredia for when he uh, knocked out Pacquiao, but no one seems to be batting a fucking eyelid at this partnership now, and it's th- this news about a failed test is just a fucking disgrace. And again, no one's really going to care about it because they're too scared of losing their free tickets for the biggest fight in decades. Yeah, it's a little disconcerting there. Um, and you're probably right. I mean, this this could be it for them, except you know, Floyd does have that one more uh, one more fight, but. I mean, is the fact that it's in there is definitely atrocious, Alex. But I mean, if neither one of them fails the test, um, what do you think about it then? Do you think the fact that this was in the contract kind of tells the whole story, and nobody just has the ball to say it at this point? I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know if it was initially in the contract. The news has only just come out now. I think uh, from Usada, I believe, but. Um... I don't know. Obviously, no one's interested in reporting about it, like I said, because they're just scared. They're not wanting to upset, you know, Applecart because they don't want to risk, you know, their jobs on this. This is the biggest fight in ages, and I think what's the point in testing at all if they're if the fight's just going to go ahead anyway? If either man pops up for ha- holding every single drug in existence and you know shooting more in their ass and. Lance Armstrong did, then well, what's the point in the testing? If it's just utterly pointless. They're trying to clean up the sport. They're trying to have this clean image. Doing a yeah, a clean sport. Usada for in the beginning, Usada's rubbish. We we've discussed Usada dozens of times on this podcast and their flaws. And even if they fail, the fight's going to go ahead anyway. What's the fucking point? Yeah. The question it is, what is the point? But logically speaking, Alex, if I was to say that there's probably no in between, and the simple fact of the matter is that either probably 90% of the fighters in the top 15 in the rankings, you know, of any sanctioning body are probably on something they shouldn't be on, and 99% of those 90% get away with it, or 5% of fighters use stuff that they shouldn't use it and 99.9% of them get away with it. What do you think would be the more logical, the, what's the more logical uh, conclusion we could come to? Well, like you said, I do believe that the majority of them are using, a vast majority are using and the vast majority get away with it because the testing is so inadequate and it's in everyone's best interest that it stays that way because fights do get cancelled. That's why they put this clause Obviously, in the testing protocols, the the fight doesn't get cancelled if the test pops because they don't want to lose out on money, and that's ultimately what's the driving force behind everything at the moment is the money, and they all want to get paid, and they can't risk having their fight stopped, and that's you know that's why Golden Boy stopped working with Vada because of two failed tests because the tests actually caught people, they actually found out that every fucker out there is a dodgy little bastard who's probably taking something they shouldn't be taking and if something catches them they're fucked how can they justify it they can't they you know if people start getting look at the ufc they've started doing a, a lot more stringent testing and uh, look at anderson silver he's popping up for everything look at john jones he's doing coke you know he's a fucking pop- proper coke little fiend yeah. isn't he It's ridiculous. And Andy, since we've moved on a little bit to the more whole concept of this conversation, I'd like to invite you back in. And, um, you know, I've kind of developed a theory recently, kind of just watching things. And I think you can possibly see the true result of it in uh, our good friend uh, SpongeBob Splitpants, otherwise known as Odlanier Solis. Um, I have serious questions about the Cuban amateur boxing team and what they do, because it seems like so many of their guys, when they get out, have no work ethic, they balloon up in weight, uh, certain athleticisms, you know, start leaking from them a little bit. Uh, you know, you're pretty uh, interested in doping from cycling on into boxing and otherwise. Do you think that I'm taking too much of a leap there, or do you think that there could be something to draw? To what regard, though, what, what fight are we talking about? Are we talking about the one that I wasn't really want to talk about, or just the fact is, you know, that... Alex is probably bang on the money that you know the sport is probably riddled with the fact that you know there's PEDs. I mean, um, 
Right, as you say, I'm, I'm slightly interested in cycling, but it's mainly due to the fact that the, I read the Armstrong report, and it's mainly based on a bit, on a bit doping. And just recently, actually, the UCI, who governs the, the World Cycling Professional Racing, um, and issued a report basically stating that they believe that up to least 90% of the professional peloton is still using PEDs, and it's like very, very small micro doses of, uh, of EPO. Um, I think there's been another two riders caught there, or there's, there's been something happened in the biolog- uh, their blood passport that's actually then flagged up there's been possible uh, usage. Um, you know, I do believe it's not just mainly to box, and I think it's actually all professional sports. I mean, I think even this country, uh, soccer or football, as, you will, as, as we call it, um, is probably quite lax with the drug test. I mean, how easy is it for a club to actually do drug testing in-house, find that their players may have been using something and maybe keep them out of the game for like six six weeks with an injury until they get their system cleared and stuff like that. You just don't know. I mean, stuff like that probably does go on. I mean, UFC, which I don't really follow that much, I mean, when some of those reports came out about the, uh, what you call him, Anderson Silver, I think he'd been using it as well. I'm, just, I'm not really into the MMA, but you know, when you read about these reports and stuff, you know, professional sports has got a problem. My, I don't know what it's like in America. I mean, you've got gridiron football there, you've got all other stuff, that like baseball. You know, you've got your own problems in that as well, with, with guys, professional athletes using drugs and stuff. Yeah. It's really, really tough to say on some ends, Andy, and, and others it is. And this is going to sound really, really weird. Um, when, when you look at it strangely, um, when you see really, really excelling white athletes, you have to take a look at them really, really closely. And the reason why I say that is there's a reason in this country why white people just suck at athletics compared to African Americans. And it's because of what they tried to do during slavery, build, you know, bring the biggest and the strongest. You know, the NFL, that's the end result. That's what happened i mean it's these crazy psychopathic slave owners and their goal to make the most efficient workers possible essentially built the national football league you look at the size of these guys and their athleticism and it's incredible but (laughs) white people we just don't have those genetics and it's it i hate to say it but i tend to think that as weird as it sounds excelling white athletes have to be looked at harder than excelling black athletes. Crazy it might sound. I don't know. Anyone have any thoughts on Well, I'll go to you. Know, well, I'll let Alex answer that one because I actually want to come back to you, but a political mm-hmm. question actually I was going to ask you about, you know, especially <laughs> about the drug testing issue, just, uh, if you want to go back to that very briefly about the, the fact is, I've probably championed for something like, you know, you should have a, like, one national commission, but do you think that Washington should be getting involved with the kind of drug testing and stuff like that and how convoluted that would be? politicians are just as corrupt as Don King. I don't see the end result being any different. See, see well, I was actually reading Arthur McCartney's book, Arthur McCartney Sr.'s book, and he was actually, oh, the opinion is that it should be left in the individual commission. But then, we all know that there's, there's, there's commissions in America that's not even fit for purpose. I mean, we've spoken on the main show about the fact is that, you know, Julio Cesar Chavez wasn't drug tested for the Andy Lee fight, or if he was, it was, it was way after the fight, if I remember rightly. The Texas Commission, in more ways than one, it is a disgrace. Um, it's, it's, I don't know. It, you, you look and you try to find a solution, and you think, oh, that might work, but then it probably won't because corruption is so rampant. Um, you know, I mean, just, I mean, a shout out. You, I mean, you want another example? Shout out to our friend Steve Cunningham. What another bullshit decision going against Steve? I mean, it's. It, it's so rampant and it's so obvious. There's so many times they don't try to put the blinders on. Uh, Benavidez against Herrera. There's another one for you. I still contend that Herrera was, uh, and his title was a sacrificial lamb to Bob Arum to make things go smoother. Um, there's just no way to fix it. It's up to us as the fans to take in what we see and make the most logical conclusion we can from it. It's man, it's all about the politics. I mean, I was talking to DJ Angelati Cannon, that's the that's the young fella that beat Ricky Burns. Um I think he was ranked something like fourth for the WBC. Just talking about the politics of the sport actually. I mean, 
Kevin Mitchell, I think, in the Daniel Estrada fight was ranked seventh. You know, after he won that fight, and he did win it convincingly, uh, to be honest, he was really good. Um, he suddenly becomes mandatory challenger, and next minute, Zlatan Cannon, who was ranked higher than, than Mitchell before that fight, is now fighting an eliminator, and he's just recently signed by Al Heyman. Um, you know, it's just, you know, I feel sorry for, for, for Zlatan Cannon, because when, when I spoke to him initially and stuff, uh, he says that there's no promoters in Montenegro, um, so he's been hunting around trying to get a promoter and stuff, and it seems like he's landed on his feet slightly, and uh, signed with Al Heyman over the last, I think he messaged me last night about 10 o'clock, I think it was, and says the, the deal had been done. So I'm really pleased to see Dejan is like can and that's actually maybe getting his move at the big time. But uh, at least with signing by Al Heyman, he will probably get his world title shot that he probably should have got this time around rather than Kevin Mitchell, probably. I don't know. I don't think anyone can make any money off of him. I, mean, I like him as a fighter. He's got a sneaky left. I'm trying yeah, to know, but so, my... so, but fairness at the end of the day, you want to see the, the, the highest ranked guy get their shot. You know, I mean, he went to Scotland and he beat Burns and they beat him convincingly, I think, and he should get his shot. I mean, well, lesser, I, less, I, lesser guys have had shots, you know. In my head, I'm trying to figure out who's in Heyman's stable and who he's going uh, to who he's gonna use to screw uh, Dijon over and, uh, you know, move him up. Oh, he's got Mikey, you know, he's, 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 is Mikey Bay at lightweight? Grow the talent. It's you know he's trying to find a he's trying to find he's got a plan up his sleeve. Just you wait, just you fucking wait. Is Mickey B a lightweight? <laughs> he's got a huge roster. I God, it could be any. I it, God, I'm trying to think. I don't know. I mean, he's got a hell of a roster down there. You know, especially and going into 140. So I don't know. But um, anyhow, Alex, you got some Twitter questions? Oh shit! I'll have to find them out. One sec. My God, what a per- un- just my God, the professionalism around here. I'm telling you. <laughs> but uh, man, uh, I am I am looking forward to Gonzalez being on HBO. I'm looking forward to Matisse against Provodnikov. And. Uh, I tell I'm you, really I'm, I'm really glad that Matisse Provodnikov fight got uh, got pushed back because I think it was getting. Initially slated in for the end of this month, I think it was early next month. Holiday. Um, was it was it April fourth or something like that? I think it was. Let's yeah, see. God has been moved because I'm actually on holiday at that time, eh? So I'm glad it's been pushed back. Yeah, and, and that's the kind of fights that we've been waiting to see, you know. Um, and it's coming at a good time too. And but I mean, we'll talk about it closer to the fight, obviously, but. There's a lot of people that I think are r- rating too much in Provodnikov, and I know enough about Alvarado and have seen enough in the ring post, uh, you know, post that Alvarado victory for Provodnikov. So I don't know. Let's see here. We got a question in here. Thomas Cummings at TJ underscore Cummings asks: Interested to get panel thoughts on Frotch? Mayo two was originally booked with Cobra in mind. Is Ward in the UK a realistic fight? You know, honestly, I don't know enough about Rock Nation where I think uh, I can make a, any sort of a claim about that one. I, I, the Rock Nation is still such a an, an, un, an unknown at this point in time. Uh, what are your thoughts, Alex? Yeah, um, it's quite similar, really. Obviously, he, I think that's quite a serious backing that Andre Ward's got. Uh, Rock Nation have made uh, very uh, serious bids before. For other fighters, obviously, and they made that uh, very, very big bid for the uh, Deontay Wilder Stiverne fight. I think it was they wanted to host that 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 world championship fight. Um, I think Heyman got in the way of that. They obviously wanted to uh, get Quillen uh, 1.4 million. They've wanted to give Broner uh, was it like 20 million or something, maybe 30 million to fight for like a five fight deal or something. Uh, yeah, they had that, and so like you say, Rock Nation, they're a very, um, you know, very mysterious and intriguing uh, group at the moment. Uh, but I do think that Ward will have serious backing, especially more so than what Frotch, uh, Frotch's backing has got at the moment. Because I think, considering Frotch is on his way out, I don't think Eddie particularly wants to pay a lot of money and uh, really go all out in securing uh, a Ward fight at home if he has to. You know, he's not gonna pay over the odds just so that Frotch gets a uh, home advantage, especially if he has to really compete against Rock Nation. So, uh, you know, it would be good to see Ward come over here. I could understand why he wouldn't come over here, purely because 
you know the the sort of decisions that we've had over here and you know no, that's not to say that the americans you guys are also have your very dodgy decisions we've seen you know you you, you just listed a few of them yourself matty uh but i do think ward will be very hesitant about coming over here he, he seems to have an aversion from leaving the united states as it is i think that that fight it's a rematch that should happen because i want to leave oakland no, exactly. I mean, he hates going anyways. A bit of a recluse in that sense, but you know, it'd be good. I think the rematch needs to happen because, well, for one, I want to see Frotch get beat up again. But from an actual, you know, a, a more neutral standpoint, I think it's still an interesting fight because it's, uh, you know, number one, number two, and Ward has been out of the ring for so long. He has been inactive, and maybe that rust will take an effect on him. Uh, that said, I also think Frotch is on his way out, so you know, it, it would probably though it's still at a level playing field that they were uh, a few years ago. Uh, either way, I don't think the fight's going to happen in the UK. Yeah, it just—I don't know. I tend to see that uh, Frotch is probably on his way out. What are you thinking, Andy? Do you think we see Frotch in the ring again? Um, uh, I think we will. Um, I'm well. Be interesting to see what happens after Chavez and Farah fight. If they're really serious about me getting that fight made, but I'd, it really depends what's going to come out of the top rank situation as well. But the guy's got the right to fight, I suppose. So I think he'll probably all get something expunged with his contract. But um, Froch, on the other hand, I think we will see him running again. Um, but that's in this country, I really don't know the situation with Rock Nation, and it seems to be it's it's, it's very odd. Um, I don't really, really follow it that much. I'd, do remember Gary Shaw signing with him, and then he left like three or four days after that. Odd set up, and I think they've only like, had one event, and apparently didn't sell many tickets, so it wasn't really a big success or whatever it was. But um, in all honesty, I really don't know. I mean, we've heard nothing about the plans for Andre Ward. I mean, you would think the length of time he's been out inactive, he's been in the gym training, keeping in shape and stuff. I mean, I think that's what he's been doing anyway, but. So you would think you would have heard something about a, a future fight happening sometime this summer, or for August at least, but we've heard nothing so far, so it's a very, very odd setup just now for Andre Ward. I really don't know what's going on there. Well, I'll tell you, on the subject of Rock Nation, I don't think that Jay-Z can do any worse than 50 Cent, you know, descending from the rafters, choking his balls as Gamboa walks to the ring. It, I, I, I honestly think, if anything, Rock Nation could do a really good job of putting on, t- taking boxing and just moving it into more of a full entertainment show, more so. Um, you know, kind of running, I guess, what they do with the uh, German and Canadian shows, kind of visually entertaining. I mean, we all love the chicks on the boxes, let's not lie. And, uh, you know, throwing in some music acts and stuff like that. So, I, I don't know, I think it could be uh, pretty good. But uh, let's see here, we got another question here. From Maverick Boxer at Maverick Boxer. Hopefully, you guys can smell Maverick out there. Yes, uh, four pod tonight. Whose entourage wins in a riot? Pax or Floyd's? And that's an interesting question. That is definitely, definitely an interesting question. Um, I'll give the size advantage to Floyd's people. Uh, what do you think, Alex? Um, I think that, yeah, purely on entourage, I think Floyd's, uh, Floyd's little entourage will win in a, in a big scrap because you, you've seen the size of some of those fuckers that Floyd's got you know walking around with him these big seven foot 500 pound motherfuckers that are just constantly flanking his sides I mean Pacquiao's got quite a few hangers on himself but nothing that compared to these big nasty looking horrible bastards and I think that they would definitely win in a fight yeah I don't know that I'd be too frightful if uh, Boo Boy was running towards me jiggling I would. Uh, Andy <laughs> Say again, mate. Who, who would win in a Who would win in a fight in a in a fight? Uh, Pax Honorage or Floyd's Honorage? I'm definitely going with Pax Honorage. I mean, these guys are hungry. I mean, they're nasty. I mean, they grew up in rice paddies and jungles and stuff like that. I mean, they fought uh, commerce insurgencies since like what. The forties, I think it is, and it's still ongoing. I mean, just pull the gorillas out of the out of the mountains. I mean, think about it. Pacquiao's got the back of a whole country. If he if he told the the, the gorillas to come out the fucking mountains and come and back him up, they would fucking do it. AK's a lot. (laughs) 
Y del mafio. Mate. Yep, I was there. I was I was tweeting over to our good friend Pat and Top who was trying to get on. Has he sent you a friend request, Andy? His question for the pod is why are y'all ducking me? Oh, speechless at that. I mean, he's got to come on and uh, obviously address that issue. Yeah, let's we'll see if uh, if we got the proper information. I know we're, we're uh, getting close to drawing to a close here. You guys are pushing towards midnight over there. Hey, he was added to the call. Wonderful. What's up? Hey, we're uh, how y'all doing? We were just bashing. Uh, we were just uh, bashing Rock Nation. I think. I think that's what we were doing. We've also gone over Matisse Probodnikov from Pound for Pound stuff. Uh, we're just kind of filling out the time. But this is, uh, for our listeners out there, this is Patton Thompson. He uh, brought us an interview with uh, Ruslan Probodnikov's manager uh, last year, I do believe it was. Um, why don't you talk on? What's on your mind tonight? Why don't you just give us a couple uh, couple thoughts on what's on your mind in the world of Boston right now, Patton? Well, y'all were, you said y'all were bashing Rock Nation. I... I actually think it it might be a good thing them coming in because I I was talking to I can't remember who it was um not too long ago I think it was yeah it was N- Nicole Duva uh, the the on Twitter that day she was bashing the Heyman cards and she was saying how how Heyman is um like overpaying everybody. And I said, well, Rock Nation is too. And she said, well, they're not big. And I don't know. They just signed Andre Ward and Miguel Cotto, two biggest names in the sport. I, I kind of think it, it's a good thing for the sport. I mean, Jay-Z doesn't do anything small. I mean, it, it'll be, I think it'll be good. What do y'all think? Patton, is that your son in the, back, in the background smashing up your house? <laughs> Yeah, it's my daughter. <laughs> Was it a drum <laughs> drum kit she's got? I, she's hungry. So she's beating on the table. <laughs> I walked in the I walked in the other room though. But on the on the Rock Nation deal, I I think it's good. I I really do. It, it it'd be nice if they could get Ward to fight. Thanks so much. What was that? I said I think that they could have they might have accomplished some things to this point if Heyman hadn't cough locked them so much. I mean they put some lucrative offers on the table. I mean, you know, Heyman took us some definitely took some commas out of some of his guys' bank accounts by not uh, taking some deals there. What it was a it was Quillen that that turned down all that money, right? Now he's fighting Lee for the, the same belt that he vacated. And I mean, what did they offer that? It was like, I mean, he overpriced that one by a ton. It was like one point four million, wasn't it? Well, yeah, well, yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous what they're paying on. I mean, on some of these things, and it's just the offers, you know. And it, Quillen turned it down. I mean, that does leave the door open for what I'm hoping for of an all Brooklyn showdown between Quillen and Jacobs. That's the goal. But there was a lot of good stuff they left on the table. I think I think it'll be good for the sport. He's he's uh you know in the NBA he's an agent and he's signed a few really big names. I think I think I think he signed Kevin Durant and um a few other guys. So you know maybe you know maybe he can get you know, some some more big names and get them to fight. You know hell, his two big fighters won't fight anybody though. I agree. I think the you know what, what what what's happening at the moment is that Heyman is really sort of getting a monopoly over there and really taking control of a lot of the big fighters and a monopoly in any situation is obviously bad we're already hearing rumors of you know the stupid PBC championships PBC titles uh Heyman really just cock blocking anyone that isn't within his own stable he's just but you know really doing it in house and you know that's really bad for the sport. So I think that if Rock Nation is willing to pay and uh, these outlandish sums just to get a foothold, and they've got control of you know the likes of Miguel Cotto and Andre Ward, I don't think Cotto's going to be in the game for much longer, unfortunately. But Ward certainly has the potential to be uh, ruling for a couple of years yet. 
you know, maybe half a decade or more, then, you know, that they should be paying over the odds just to get a foot. They've also got the, the funds to do that. And, yeah, I think they'll definitely help. Um, they've got to do a bit more than just uh, make outlandish offers. They've actually got to put, start putting uh, shows on, putting cards on, and uh, really getting their name out there in that way. I've, they've only had one card, haven't they? Yeah. Um, who was on that card? Yeah. I'd... To, I don't know. Top, who it was, it was. Dusty know. Hernandez and Tommy Rayon, I think, was the, yeah. was the main event, I think. I remember. Dusty Hernandez, I think it was. Uh, yeah, I remember we'll watching see, uh, it briefly. Harrison, uh, the headline of their card. Yeah, if you want to know the depth of their roster, their headline right now is Dusty Hernandez Harrison. <laughs> I mean, they've got the, the appeal of, you know, the celebrities ringside. Obviously, Jay Z was there and Beyonce was there, and they've all got their you know, big A-list uh, sort of friends and mates that can uh, draw in that casual interest, but ultimately they need the roster and they need the fighters to build it. They can't just have everyone come and meet and greet all the famous musicians. They actually need to have fighters and good fights because this is boxing, you know, it's not showbiz, and give them a uh, you know, proper opportunity and I think hopefully they can do well with it. Well, we'll definitely find out on moving forward. I mean, there's just there, it's good to see there's some players in the game, but the monopoly that Heyman's building, uh, I don't know. It's either going to make for some great fights or or not. I mean, he might have the greatest master plan ever, and we benefit from it, and everyone else kind of has to just suck it, and or it could be the worst thing ever. Right now, I'll tell you what it what it is doing is it's making guys like HBO go to strange places, like to Roman Gonzalez to start filling their slots and stuff like that and then becoming acceptable opponents. So maybe this is a good thing. You know, uh, you don't necessarily need to have familiarity with the person to be entertained with the fight. You just put them on the right place and going on a Canelo undercard. That's some brilliant stuff right there. Um, let's see here. Hey, Alex, what fights do we have going a week from Saturday? You happen to know of a big card going there? Well, there's quite a few cards, isn't there? Uh, I think, obviously, the Kell Brook card, I don't know if you want to really consider that a big card. It's obviously big over in the UK. Uh, some fairly decent undercard fights. Um, there's, I think, Daenerys fighting in the Philippines, isn't he? William Prado. And uh, there's the Gonzalez-Russell Jr. fight, isn't there? Uh, stateside. I think uh, Van is my erosions on that. Jamel Charlo, or one of the Chima uh, Charlo brothers anyway, or I can't re never can remember which one it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still can't figure out which one I think has the most upside here, but yeah, so let's see here. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a new game that we're going to be playing for this podcast. And since there's nothing huge this week, we're going to keep it uh, in the next week, give you guys a chance to think about it. But so tweet over to either me, SFP Matty D on Twitter, or Alex KTC, at KTC Boxing with your combined weight for Johnny Gonzalez and Gary Russell Jr., along with Jamal Charlo and Vanis Martirosian. So those are going to be 126 and 154 weight limits. So you're looking at, they all weigh in at their weight limit. It should be 300 and, no, it should be 460 pounds of fighters. No? No, more than that. My God, my math is terrible anymore. But anyhow. Text what you think, or send us a tweet what you think their combined weight is going to be, and what that will get you is 90 seconds on our podcast the week after, if you are the closest one, to add 90 seconds of hate towards any fighter, any person in boxing you want, uninterrupted, on the podcast. So remember, tweet to me, SFP Matty D, or Alex at KTC Boxing. Uh, you guys got anything you want to add before we round this up? So they get, they get 90 seconds just to lay blast on anyone, and we kind of do nothing about it. Yeah. This, yeah. This, 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 this could be Radio Gold. We get Chad Hogan back on the show. It'd be good. It, it could be fun. I'm hoping you guys enjoy this one. We're going to think of some more games and stuff to do like this, keep it interesting for you. But yeah, if you want 90 seconds to rip on Alex, you want 90 seconds to rip on Andy, this is your chance too. You can make it happen. <laughs> I uh, I know there's some hate out in the Twitterverse for you guys, you know, and I know you're very receptive to it, so I'm sure you can handle it. But, uh, yeah. Alex, uh, he just oh. put us up an offer, mate. 
before we go. Don, you got in just at the right time. How are you, Sugar Bridges? <laughs> Pretty good. How about yourself? Single and ready to mingle, hot stuff. What's up? I said single and ready to mingle, hot stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So what, why did I just get in at the right time? The show is just ended, that's right. Are oh, you just ended? <laughs> yeah. uh, we're still live, but uh, we're about to end soon. Wait, are we still live or seriously? Yeah, yeah. We're still live. Yeah, you're talking to the world right now, Donnie, and it's all going to be recorded and everyone can hear it. Shit, fuck, balls, pussy, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's the sponsors chased away already. <laughs> Anyhow, this was a really, really fun time. I'm glad getting back into it. I missed the podcast. I missed you guys. I'd like to thank everyone for joining, even a couple of them are short time. Uh, Pat and Thompson, Donnie Baseball, and, of course, my old friends Andy Patterson and Alex Morris, my buddies from across the pond. Really appreciate you guys coming in and doing a show with us in the middle of the week. We have to make this consistent for you. Uh, once again, I'm your host, Matthew John Arthur, and Boston Asylum. We'll see you next week.